Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Welcome. I'll give you uh, folks just one more minute before we get started. There's others in the waiting room. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning, everyone. I would like to announce that we do have interpretation available for this event. So if anyone would like to listen to the presentation in Spanish or in English, you do have to click the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and you can choose either the English or Spanish version. And a big thanks to Jeanette and Jasmine for supporting us this morning with the Spanish interpretation. So I'll repeat that once more for the individuals who are just joining us. Please find the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and make sure to click either the Spanish or English option to hear this presentation in. Great, so I'd like to welcome you to our Truth and Credit presentation this morning, uh, hosted on behalf of LA Civil Rights in partnership with CARE. I'd like to start off with an icebreaker for us to get to know each other very briefly. So if you all can take a moment and use the chat box to share which region you are calling in from. And I'll read some responses out loud. We have the Central Valley here. Thank you for sharing your response. If others would like to share, where are they zooming in from? South Los Angeles, welcome. Thank you. Culver City, West LA. Good morning, thank you for being here. Victorville, thank you so much for joining. Pomona, thank you so much, welcome. Let's move on to the next question as folks feel free to continue answering in the chat. Our second question for the day is please share what you are most, most excited to learn about today. And I know we have so much great information coming your way. If you'd like to share what you are most excited to learn about today. While you all write the response to that question, thank you so much. I know that is a longer one. I will yield the floor to my colleague, Candy. She's going to make a brief announcement for us, and then we'll get started with the presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, just before we get started, we would like to thank you for coming here and take a moment to take a photo with all those everyone attending. Um, this photo will be used for our newsletter and also for our social media. If you don't feel comfortable, um, please feel free to take yourself off the screen and I will just take a couple of uh, seconds to take some screenshot photos. Okay, so give me one second and I'll give you guys a moment. I see that some people actually have turned on their cameras oh, to be a part yeah. of this photo. So that's that's more than welcomed as well. So if you want to turn on your, your camera to be a part of this photo, that's fine as well. Thank you. Yes. So I will um, take the photo now. 
One, two, three. Smile, everyone. <laughs> okay. And then one, two, three. Thank you, everyone. I'll hand it back to Raska and Angie. Thank you so much, Candy. Thanks everyone again for being here. It is now my privilege to introduce Capri Maddox, the Executive Director of Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles Civil and Human Rights and Equity Department, also known as LA Civil Rights. Um, Capri Maddox was appointed to the department's, uh, to be the department's first Executive Director in 2020 to address systematic racism and bias in the areas of commerce, education, employment, and housing. Under her leadership, LA Civil Rights continues to work towards leveling the playing field through partnerships with community partners, as well as commissions and advisory bodies. She has worked for the city of Los Angeles for over 30 years and is a proud double graduate of Cal State LA with a JD from Pepperdine Law. Capri, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Aracia, and I'm super grateful to be here and to share space with you know great folks that are ready to make a difference and folks that are taking the extra time to um, invest in their future. And I think uh, this is something that's important. You know, years and years from now, your life will be so much different than it is today, or maybe compared to some of your counterparts. And it'll all be because you stepped up and did the extra thing. And when you're willing to do something that other people aren't willing to do, it makes a force multiplying difference um, in your life. And so people say, you're so lucky that you have this or that, but um, a little bit of it is the luck, a little bit of it's blessings, and a little bit of it is you getting up on Saturday morning to do things that other people weren't willing to do. So I commend everyone that's on the call, especially you know, our young folks that are here. Um, definitely want to thank Credit Abuse Resistance and Education, also known as CARE, for opening this avenue to explore and understand the crucial aspects of credit education. Um, during my time at LAUSD, um, I worked there just for a year, 2018, 2019, in charge of partnerships. I had the privilege of working with Denise uh, Gutierrez and from CCEE, um, uh, community, sorry, uh, California Council on Economic Education. And I think it's important to know that during that time, I really learned, and I'm so happy she's here with us today to share a space and a couple and some words as well. Um, but I, but I realized that so many of us, especially myself included, you know, first generation or I'm an LAUSD alum, um, from Fairfax High, shout out Fairfax. Uh, and when when we when we think about it, people learn about financial literacy from their parents. And when you have, you know, 80 to 90 percent of LAUSD students whose parents, you know, may, you know, have a hard time living in Los Angeles in general, um, when you think about um, the numbers of people that are eligible, whether you receive it or not, but their families that are eligible for free and reduced lunch are, you know, well over 80, almost 90 percent. We need to think about the future, and you all, um, you know, that are on this call aren't defined by you know your circumstances, but by you know your potential and and how you invest in that potential. And that's what you're all doing here today. So, in the fast-paced world of financial literacy, it is more than important um, for us to have the ability to empower individuals with the knowledge, skills to make informed credit decisions, and that's what you know, Angie and um, Roxy are, are doing here with us under the leadership of Diamond James is to make sure that we have upward mobility opportunities to help people get into the middle class and beyond. That's college and career re readiness. That's, you know, how to open a business, how to be an entrepreneur and how to get into law school, how to get in medical school. And I know they're going to shout out a couple of events that are coming up soon too, but financial literacy is an essential part of upward mobility because what good is it if we help you get into law school, but you know you don't know how to manage your money, you won't get the benefits of um, moving forward and, and, and all the investment in your academic or even your trade professions. So I wanna let you know um, that upward mobility is something that encapsulates, encapsulates um, the 
promise that regardless of one's circumstances at birth, and that's what it is. It's not where you start. It's where you're, you're going. Everyone should have the opportunity to climb the uh, socioeconomic ladder to reach for a brighter future and the better and to improve your prospects for themselves, for yourselves and your families. Um, I just really want to tell you that you know, there are various types of credit to get into and to learn about financial well-being, but it's it's super important to just know that, you know, undoubtedly, un undoubtedly um, I know that information today will contribute to your financial success and the security that you will have in your future. So with that, I want to tell you that you're in great hands. I uh, love that Candy is here, you know, taking our picture and documenting these special moments. But um, this is a difference maker in your life. And I just want to yield the floor so that people that are a lot smarter than me in this space um, can can teach you all the things that I and some of these lessons I didn't learn the very hard way. Um, so I'm almost a little little gray jelly of you all that you're getting this information from the experts today. And one of those experts is my friend. Denise Gutierrez, uh, she's dedicated her entire career to making a difference. She's from, uh, before she was with CCEE, she was with my beloved Cal State LA, um, which is uh, the school that is number one in upward mobility, meaning taking people from the bottom 3% of, uh, of income levels and taking them to the higher highest, um, you know, three to 5% of income levels. And I just think it's really, um, important to know someone who's been a champion in this space for many years to be here with you just to say a few words. She'll give brief remarks about the importance of financial literacy and her organizations. Denise? Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Capri, for the invitation. I love that LA City uh, Rights is hosting this uh, webinar for and uh, focusing on credit. Uh, again, my name is Denise Gutierrez. I'm the president and CEO for the California Council on Economic Education. We're also known as CCEE. Um, you can find us at ccee.org. Uh, we are an organization that focuses on financial literacy and economic education for K through 12. Uh, thanks to Capri's leadership, we do have and have are continuing our partnership with LAUSD. We host a number of family financial literacy events, both online and in person, and we cover for for example, online events, uh, we'll cover credit, we'll cover FAFSA, we'll cover scholarships. So all those types of, 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 of disciplines. And then also um, in person, uh, we do these with the families. So we encourage parents to be there with their children to start to talk about their finances at home. So they start to better understand how their parents are managing their finances and also how to apply that as they uh, go on into adulthood. Um, a lot of what we do is uh, personal uh, pr professional development for K through 12 teachers. Specifically, we have uh, we do a lot of training for econ teachers because economics is a required course for students to take before they graduate from high school. We make sure students learn how to navigate the economy, but also learn how to manage their personal finance. So we cover both the micro and macro with econ teachers. Um, we also, uh, besides the family financial literacy events, uh, we also host a number of student contests. Uh, you can visit our website for your high school students and even middle school students to learn more about our uh, student contests. We host the financial advisors contest. Students win cash prizes. We also host the personal finance challenge contest, which goes on to national competitions, and we host the national economics challenge contest. Uh, most recently, we just uh, are partnered with the SIFMA Foundation, and we are now offering the stock market game for fourth grade to 12th grade. It's an amazing partnership. Uh, again, if you visit the SIFMA, S-I-F-M-A Foundation, you can learn more about the stock market game for your kids. It is teacher-led, so the teachers are required to sign your kids up and, and participate. Again, it's an app-based program. The students could use it from their phones. Um, they get to compete in teams, and there's also a competition component. We have an after-school program, and I'm proud to say that we are have partnered with the LA, uh, the Boys and Girls Club LA Metro, and we're at all four locations. Our Never Too Young uh, program teaches third through sixth graders uh, personal finance, entrepreneurship, and economics. Again, you're welcome. Your students are welcome to encourage their teachers to bring this um, to their classrooms. 
Uh, everyone knows a teacher. Please encourage your teachers to visit our website so they can uh, bring these free resources and materials. We are a nonprofit, so we don't charge our teachers. In fact, um, a lot of our professional development that we offer to our teachers is at no cost. Um, and oh, and then I failed to mention we have a program called Smart Path. It's for first through eighth grade. Uh, it takes us an hour to train your, the teachers. Uh, there's a pre post test assessment and all that good stuff. So students really learn like I said, to navigate our economy, invest in their greatest resource, which is their own human capital. Um, and, and so that way they have a more financially stable uh, future for themselves. Um, I'm here, I've been here at CCE for five years. Uh, like Capri said, I spent most of my career in higher education. I'm the first in my family to go to college. And the reason why I'm so passionate about creating economic and uh, uh, economic ability for our communities is because my dad was very involved with the Chicano movement. And uh, I just feel like I'm living on, I'm living uh, his legacy. <laughs> so thank you for being here on a Saturday morning. Um, you know, build your credit, better understand it. There's so much great information out there. Just be cautious, you know, when they're charging you, there's, there's always, you know, don't fall for those kinds of things. Um, there's definitely free resources. And of course, LA uh, Civil Rights is a resource for you. So happy Saturday. Have a fabulous day, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, now I have the privilege of uh, introducing our next two speakers. I'm so grateful that our presenters are, you know, volunteers with CARES LA chapter. Uh, you have Jeffrey Pomerantz and uh, Jennifer Cruz. And um, Jeffrey is the member of a prestigious law firm in Santa Monica. He is on the management committee and he's also co-chair of the firm's uh, creditors committee practice. I mean, you couldn't get, I mean, there are people that pay a lot of money to, to get advice from Jeffrey. So we are very, very grateful uh, for, for him being with us today. But I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about him. Um, he is someone that was the president of the American Bankruptcy Institute, um, the largest restructuring organization in, in the United States. Uh, his practice includes representing companies, creditors, um, and private equity funds in complex uh, financial restructuring and merger and acquisition transactions, both in and out of court. Um, as a fellow attorney, I'm telling you that this uh, his resume is truly impressive. And uh, by the way, like Denise said, I'm first generation, a lot of things, um, you know, it's something that um, is is important for me to share that, um, you know, this work that we are able to do is something that is a product of people, you know, reaching out and leaning in to make a difference. So truly happy that Jeffrey is with us. And I also would like to acknowledge Jennifer Cruz. She is a judicial law clerk for the Central District of California. Um, and I think it's, a, she is, um, she was working with the bankruptcy judge. And I think um, prior to her clerkship, she represented hundreds of clients in chapter seven, 11 and 13 cases. So chapter seven, chapter 11 and chapter 13 cases. Uh, you'll learn more about that, but this is these are things that won't be in your future. Um, hopefully if you're young, um, but if you're someone that needs a little bit of restructuring, it's good for you to, to know that Jennifer has those skills as well. In 2021, she was selected by the National Conference of Bankruptcy Judges for the prestigious Blackshear Presidential Fellowship. I mean, she's amazing. And she's also a member of the American Bankruptcy Institute, the Orange County Federal Bar Association, um, and the Jerry A. Brown back, uh, Bankruptcy Ends of Court. Um, Jennifer and Jeffrey provide valuable financial literacy education. And I'm thankful for them uh, for taking the time to do this presentation uh, for us. And if I'm not correct, uh, Judge Cruz, is, is it Judge Cruz? Not yet, okay, you're working with the judge, okay. But that's in your future. So when it's time for you to, to, to go through that process, count me in as a reference. I'm very, very grateful that you are sharing space with us. And with that, I'll let them take it away. And again, you're in good hands of the staff. And I, can I just shout out um, Mina Anochi? She's um, one of our policy fellows and um, 
a recent graduate of UCLA, and we had the privilege of being with her yesterday to, uh, at UCLA Law to talk about hate crimes. So with that, I, I appreciate all the courtesies there, but I'd like to ask uh, Jeff and um, Jennifer to take it away for us. Thank you so much, Jeff. Well, th thank you very much, Capri and Denise, for that wonderfully warm welcome. Um, there is no better place that I know I would like to be than on a Saturday morning than sharing some information that we hope will be valuable and will uh, be able to put all of you on a good track towards financial independence and to make sure that certain mistakes that are made by millions of people around the country are not made by you. Um, I, I found particularly interesting the comments made about the level of debt crisis and how it's how the timeliness and the importance of a seminar such as this. I was reading an article in the paper this week that said that the amount of household debt is at new levels, not even seen even before the pandemic, and it's over $18 trillion. At the same time, the statistics show that the amount of people who are not paying back that debt on a timely basis is increasing. And as we all know, inflation over the last couple of years has taken a big bite out of people's paychecks. So I think this is incredibly timely and I really thank um, the organization for having us here and for all of you getting up in the morning on a Saturday morning to basically uh, come to this seminar, which again, we hope will provide valuable information so as uh, Capri said, my name is Jeff Pomerantz. Um, by day, I'm a bankruptcy lawyer, but I don't get nearly the satisfaction in my daily life work that I get, again, sharing this information. Uh, this has been a passion of mine. I basically have two children, one who's 26 now, one who's 17 in high school. And around 15 years ago, when my son was in middle school, I decided that as a bankruptcy lawyer, I needed to uh, make sure that they knew some financial principles and that they knew the information that they wouldn't get into trouble. And I came across this organization called CARE. <clears throat> now CARE stands for Credit Abuse Resistance Education. It was started by a bankruptcy judge, Judge Nympho, 22 years ago in Rochester, New York, a small town in New York City, in, uh, north of New York City. And he found that a lot of the people that were coming into his courtrooms, filing individual bankruptcies, a lot of the people that Jennifer spent years representing before she became a clerk, all had one thing in common. They lacked basic financial literacy. So they did not understand basic principles, interest, credit score, the difference between credit cards and debit cards, et cetera, how to build your credit, how your credit could be lost, what you should be thinking about when you're when you're um, uh, taking out credit, all those things he found was lacking. And while it has become a lot more prevalent in schools and organizations to teach this type of stuff, um, he started this organization 20 years ago. Uh, bankruptcy judges, bankruptcy clerks, lawyers, lenders, investment bankers, all people who had one thing in common. They saw the ramifications of people getting into debt and not being able to handle it and how it could ruin their life. So he found passionate individuals all around the country. We have around 35 different chapters. Our chapter has been in existence for six years. And our mission is to go in and be talking to young adults, young families, um, even older people. I've had, can't tell you the number of comments similar to Capri is like, hey, I wish I would have known this when I was young. We've had a lot of teachers come and say that's that to us after. So you are lucky, you are getting access to this um, early on. We'd like this presentation to be as interactive as possible. Obviously there's some limitations when we're doing it virtually, but we'll use the chat screen. And if anyone has questions as we're talking about things, please feel free to uh, put them in there. We'll do our best to answer them. So let me just turn it over to Jennifer to give a little bit more of her background and then we'll get started with the substance. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, Capri, thank you so much. That was a, such a great introduction. Uh, she touched on um, many of the points of uh, my experience in insolvency, bankruptcy. Um, I am a first-generation college student as well um, and the first to go on to law school. Um, so um, this is really a passion of mine and Jeff's as well. Um, 
to give you all this information, to um, be here to answer your questions and um, to hopefully um, avoid anyone um, having to, um, you know, deal with financial problems because they are not, um, you know, it's nothing that um, from my experience that I want to witness people go through. Um, and uh, she touched on everything, but I do my uh, before my clerkship, I did represent um, mostly consumers. So um, I have a lot of valuable information there. And as he said, we're just here to answer any questions. And um, we hope you all enjoy the presentation. OK, so we'll just get this going. Can everyone see the screen, hopefully? OK, good. So look, what I like to start and to just level set to get sort of a little bit of idea of the people we're talking to. So by putting in the chat room, who have had uh, discussions whether it be with a parent, whether it be a friend, whether it be a teacher, whether it be a colleague, regarding financial literacy, credit cards, interest rates, savings rates, credit scores. Who by a show of, let's see. Okay. So we have, get the chat open. Okay, so we have, Feel free to just put it in the chat. Okay, I think we have some some there that have. Um, also, by a show of hands, we no actually by show of hands by uh, by numbers and putting in the chat room, we want to get a sense of where do people think that their current level of financial literacy is. Anyone who thinks it's a one to four or a four to seven or a seven to ten, why don't you just put in? Okay, so it seems like we have a bunch of fives and fours and sixes. I'll tell an interesting story of recently I gave a presentation. I gave a presentation at a local temple, and uh, I asked the same question, and a kid uh, raised his hand in the beginning and said an eight. After an hour and 20 minutes, we had our session, and I asked him again, and, he, and it was a vibrant session. He was asking questions, learning a lot, and asked him again, and he said I'm an eight. I said, I don't understand this, Jacob. What are you talking about? You basically sat here for an hour and two minutes. He says, you know, when I came in, I thought I was an eight. But after hearing this, I realized I was a five. But now I think I'm an eight. So for those of you who think you're a four, fives, or sixes, we'll hope to get you in, in, increase that knowledge. For those of you who are a little less, uh, again, the importance here is to have a few takeaways of important information that's practical advice that you can live with that will hopefully uh, make a difference. Okay. okay, when I say the term credit, what does that mean to people? Put in the chat what credit means. Okay. A loan, that is right, a loan. A loan is a credit transaction, the amount that company and entities entrust me, right. So the concept of credit is when you are using someone else's money. Now, the, the typical example of a credit transaction is a loan, but credit transactions can be your utility bill, can be your phone bill, can be when Capri asks to borrow money from me to buy lunch. That's a credit transaction, right? Obviously, it's a different type of credit transaction where I know Capri and, and I think she's going to pay me back. So really no reason to uh, be worried about that and charge her interest. But any type of transaction where someone is loaning money to someone else, and it's the ability to borrow money, right? It's not, and that's what we talk about in terms of there's good credit and there's bad credit. Obviously, the concept of good credit is you are a good credit risk. You're going to pay less for that credit as compared to someone who has bad credit. Now, those of you who are young might be asking, it's like, okay, I get it, but um, I'm under 18, and how do I really do this? How do I start from zero? And that's something we're going to get to, some things that you can do to try to help and start building your credit even before you are 18. Right, so 
um, and it's a score to gouge risk, right? So that'll be, we'll talk about what the credit scores are. But yes, the whole concept is a credit transaction. There's a lender, um, there's the person who owes the money, who is the debtor, who unfortunately, if they don't pay back their money, can find themselves in bankruptcy. But that's, again, that's the, the, the concept, any type of transaction when you're loaning money to someone else, okay? The ability to borrow money, that's your ability. What ability do you have? And what what do some people think? What is What might go into the ability to borrow money? Why might some people be able to borrow more? Maybe their income level, right? The higher the income level, they can show that they can pay back their assets, right? The assets they have, right? What assets do they have? Rep repayment history, good financial history. Exactly. All those types of things is the ability to borrow money. And next, borrowing money creates a debt. And the debt is what you owe. Again, some simple, basic principles. And it costs money to borrow money, right? That is an important thing, and that is where the nub of credit. And again, what we're trying to teach you here today is not not to use credit, okay? Credit is a part of our world. It's a part of your ability to function as an independent adult. For those of you who are young, going to be an independent adult. For those of you who are adults who are trying to become financially independent. But it costs money, and it's important to get into the position where you don't have make credit decisions that ultimately hurt your ability to be financially independent. Okay. Okay, so when I started doing this, uh, my son who was in middle school at the time, I think I told you, he says, you know, you can try to be funny, you could try to make jokes, but it kind of would be important to have maybe some videos, you know, just in case you can't be funny to get professional. So. Anyone who's older, you know, on the phone may recognize these two people um, on the screen. It's a Saturday night uh, live episode, but it's kind of funny, but there's some really good principles that come out of it. That video obviously is, is a funny take on what is a really important basic principle. And a lot of the stuff we're going to go through, a lot of the stuff is common sense, but as we all know, common sense isn't all too common. Um, and it, it, again, we want to make people thoughtful right? Going and buying things, it's easy to put things on credit cards, right? There's not the immediacy. We're living in a world that people don't have cash in their pockets. I told my 17-year-old daughter she needs to have cash in her pockets. And she looked and said, why? Okay, it's a totally different world than we were growing up. And there have been a lot of studies that have been done that people will pay more and buy things if they're using their credit card, than if they're using cash. Why? Because there's not that connection. Cash, you have to take out of your wallet or purse and you have to pay and you have less and you can see it. Credit card is a piece of plastic. It basically is something you could put off. You don't have to worry about it till you get your bill. Then we'll talk about paying. What if you pay the minimums and the problems you get in there? But it's really being intentional. What am I buying? Can I buy it? We have a course also that we teach on budgeting. And one of the things we talk about there are needs versus wants. What are the things somebody needs? What are the things somebody wants? And making sure to pay for it and how to pay for it. So again, being thoughtful about your financial transactions. That is the overall theme that we're trying to uh, get by, uh, get through to you today. Oh. Let's see. Okay. Go ahead, Jennifer, take it over. Yes, thank you so much, Jeff. So this next slide is gonna talk about why is credit important? And basically, as we previously discussed and what our young adults and our adults that are here already know is credit is a necessary part of an adult's everyday life. And if properly managed, it's a good thing. If mismanaged, it is not so good. But it's important for me to say right now, um, just because someone has bad credit does not make them a bad person and vice versa. Just because someone has good credit doesn't necessarily make them a good person. So it's important that I put that out there 
because people do fall on financial hard times. There are things that are out of your control, but hopefully we can teach you all some things that can help you manage uh, the credit, which is the most important part. So there are three C's of credit, character, capacity, and collateral. So character is basically your reputation, Capacity would lead to what we previously discussed is basically your ability to obtain credit and your capacity to pay it back. And collateral deals with, uh, there's a little picture of a home that can be a home, a car, or any other asset that is put up basically uh, for security for the debt, which is basically saying, I'm going to maybe a, a car or a home or even something less um, big than that. And it basically just says, I am going to allow you to take uh, this asset if I do not pay you as a means to offset the amount that I owe you. So that is a, kind of a basic description of what collateral is. And, um, this slide is important and this kind of breaks down what I know a lot of people want to know and understand about, oh, I'm sorry, look, I got the, uh, the, the next slide, Jeff. Okay, here we go. There we go. So this is an important one and this is one on where um, we want to take our time because I know a lot of people want to know what a credit score is and what goes into the determination of that score, because we hear about the scores, but what actually goes into computing that score. And here you see that typically 35% is your payment history. About 30% is amount owed. 15% is the length of history. 10% is your new credit. And 10% uh, is a credit mix. So that's where they're looking at whether you have secure loans, unsecured credit cards, that etc cetera, etc cetera. but the most important part is what the payment history and payment history and the amounts owed are basically 65 percent of your score so it is very important to pay uh your debts on time and it's also important to make sure that you don't take on too much debt because that's the things that the credit uh the creditors are looking at because those are the things that go into whether or not uh, your past history on whether you're going to pay going forward. And then the amounts owed is basically lead to your capacity. If you borrow too much and you don't make enough money, then eventually you're going to start getting behind. And those are the things that the credit uh, uh, the creditors are looking at before they loan you money. Uh, the length of history is a bit important, but it is not. It is um, not uh, sorry, I heard a feedback. It's not the uh, ultimate most important, but that goes to show over time your ability to pay and things of that nature and then new credit. So you don't want to just, they're looking at whether you're going out and just opening new credit cards um abundantly or consecutively those things can hurt your score because that will raise a red flag to the creditors as in maybe there's something going on or that the other creditors are looking at okay the more credit you get the less that you have to pay me back on my loan so it's important to pay on time watch the amounts that you borrow and then um you know, the, the length of time that you have the credit and then not taking on too much new credit going forward. So this is often a good slide. And I know that a lot of people wanted um, to know about credit scores and what we essentially call for our young people, your adult credit, your adult report card, right? When you go to school, you're graded. But when you get into adulthood, this is essentially your report card and what other people will see as far as um, your character and, uh, well, your character as far as paying back loans. It's not just your overall character. 
Yes, let me add a couple of things there. So yeah, to, to follow up on Jennifer's last point. Yeah, look, in school, you have a, a, a report card and people make judgments about you, right? If you're an A student, people will make certain judgments. You're responsible, you study hard, you're smart. You're a C student, they may say, well, maybe he doesn't spend enough time on the uh, on their, their grades and you know maybe they're not too smart. And, and those judgments may not be correct, right? We all know people make judgments as soon as they see someone, as soon as they see something that may, may not be correct, but it is a judgment and you have to work against it. Same thing with a credit score. You have a good credit score and we're gonna talk as a slide about who might be looking at your credit score even beyond, and beyond um, people who are giving you money. So it's very important to view it in that lens that it says a lot about you, right? It's a number, but it says a lot about you. And to go into a little more on a couple of the components, the, the payment history. Every type of credit transaction you have, whether it's a phone bill, whether it's a utility bill, whether it's a rent payment, whether it's a car payment, whether it's a home payment, all those, all that information, and we'll tell you where it gets funneled, is funneled to a place and they spit that stuff in a computer and it comes out as a number. The payment history, you make one mistake, it's going to affect it. Now, again, to Jennifer's point, if you make a, you make a mistake, you make a mistake. This is not about perfection. You know, we've always heard the saying, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. So don't get too dis disappointed. But recognize that, you know, they are looking at every little thing. And why? Because if you're going to lend money to someone, you want to see that they have a history of paying it back. I went to get a new house loan a couple of years ago, and they asked about one late payment like four years before, which, of course, I didn't even remember. I mean, I had to explain it. Amounts owed, you know, to Jennifer's point, if you make $30,000 a year and you have $15,000 in capacity and credit cards, you know, someone's going to really be a little leery about giving you anything, any more money because you have so much. That's why the amounts owed can negatively affect. And length of history, again, for the young people out there, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going out into the adult world. How do I deal with that? Well, Early stages in your financial life, it's going to be more challenging, just like driving a car. Car insurance is going to be more expensive. Things are more expensive as you're a young adult. But doing the right things before you turn 18 and doing the right things after you turn 18 when you're building your own credit is extremely important. Okay. So why do we care about credit? We've talked a little bit about this. Um, for those of you who are in college or going to college. I remember my first day in college many, many years ago. I went to the bookstore to get my books. And in the bag that I they put the books, there was like six different credit card uh, applications. You're going to start getting inundated with credit card. I, like my kids, even when they were like 10, 11, they would get, you know, Visa, MasterCard, Ryan, Lauren, you know, apply for credit. It's, it's, it's kind of insane out there. And everyone is out there and wants people to fill out applications They'll make it enticing. Well, do this and you'll get 10% off or do this and it'll be free for this amount of time. There are all these gimmicks. And we'll also talk about, you know, comparing credit cards, how to make sure you're getting the right credit card for you. Um, but understanding it now, understanding how the credit works, mm -hmm. understanding when you get your first credit card, understanding how to use it, understanding how it works, understanding what a minimum payment does, what it doesn't do how paying back all that stuff is, 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 is really important. To the extent you have and you carry a lot of debt and you increase and you're part of that $18 trillion I talked about, or you're part of that delinquency rate, those will have real negative ramifications in your life. There are a lot of young adults that get out there, have no understanding of how this works, and then we'll find in five years, they owe $10,000 and they're making $30,000. And they'll say, how will I ever be able to pay that back? And you know what happens then? That's when they come and see Jennifer and me. And bankruptcy has its place. As Jennifer said, it doesn't make you a bad person. There are circumstances. A lot of bankruptcies are uh, as a result of medical bills that are uh, you know, unexpected and stuff. Uh, but again, having this knowledge, having this information, 
uh, hopefully will allow you to make better decisions. Okay, so who might make decisions about you? Well, before I do that, why don't I ask the question instead of giving the answers? Who might make decisions about you based upon your credit report? If you put in the chat, who would be interested in knowing? Okay. Anybody in the chat want to? Banks, good, of course. Banks were want to know. Okay. Auto dealership, car dealerships, right? Uh, of course, before they want to, you know, give you a car loan, credit bureau, right? Employer, landlord, that was a good one. So I want to, I want to stop on that one for a second because that's one that people typically don't get. So, William, I commend you. Why do we think an employer or a landlord uh, will want to know your credit score? Anyone have any ideas of why that's important? It's a, Great answer, but why? Okay, well, honor commitments, right? That Look, that's the point. Again, we were saying basically you have a credit score and it basically tells you, makes certain impression on people. If you have a high credit score, again, doesn't mean you're gonna be a great employee, but somebody would probably think, I'm going to hire this person. They have a high credit score. They're responsible, right? You as an employer want to hire responsible people. You as a landlord want to rent to people who not only will pay their, their rent on time, which of course is very important, but will, will be responsible people. Again, it goes to the theme that the credit report says a lot about you and it will um, tell people what type of person you are um, and again, if you have a low credit score, it doesn't mean you can't convince people that you're responsible, but it's a good, it's a good start if you can. Okay. Next. All right. So what I, we, we talked about information getting spit into a computer to come up with your credit score, but essentially there are three organizations. Don't ask me why there are three, but they essentially do the same thing. It's called Equifax, it's called Experian, and it's called TransUnion. So anytime somebody makes an inquiry on your credit, so for example, I just got a new uh, new car uh, lease, and I got a notice that somebody made an inquiry on my credit. Every time you basically have a credit transaction, uh, your credit card companies, et cetera, they will report whether you are paying in time, okay? And that gets all spit in to a computer and comes out with a number. Now, a lot of people may say, okay, I'll worry about that when I have to get credit. So why do I really need to care about my, 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 uh, my credit score now? Well, I'll tell you why. So something happened to my wife and I, my wife's first name is Debbie, D-E-B-I, so not a typical spelling of the name Debbie. When we were buying our first house 30 years ago, we hadn't checked our credit score probably ever. I was like in my mid twenties, and we went to the bank and to get a loan. And what are the what is the first thing that a bank does when they looking to to give you a loan? They run a credit report, and they came out and there was eight entries for another Jeff and Debbie spelled the same name Pomerantz that were not us. And there were a couple of problems with a couple of the entries. There was car loans. There was this. There was that. It took us a few months to get that stuff off. And that was 30 years ago. Nowadays, I'm sure everyone hears, seems like every week there's another article about another data breach, about another, you know, hacking of information into, you know, retailers and whatnot and getting sensitive information. The amount of fraud that is out there is incredible. We also have a presentation on cyber fraud. And it's chilling seeing some of the things that are out there. I mean, I just got this morning a text that's like, UPS, your driver basically can't uh, can't find your package, uh, you find your house, click here and give us your information. So I took that tracking number, put it into UPS on, on my own browser. Yeah, that doesn't exist. So there's so much stuff out there. And the point is that you need to go every year 
And you can go to annualcreditreport.com, free credit report. There's, just put it in a browser. How do I get my free credit report? And check and make sure that the items on your credit report are accurate. You do not want to wait for that time when you're going to get a car loan or whatever type, you know, you're going to apply for a credit card and somebody is going to come back denied. Denied why? Because here are these five things that are you. And you'll say, that's not me. And it's hard to get that stuff off and it takes time. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So the credit report, uh, the credit score is uh, reflected in a number. The lowest number you can have is 300. I'm not sure I ever really saw 300. And the highest number is an 850. I'm not sure I ever really saw an 850. All those things we talk about go into uh, coming up with your score. Uh, good scores tend to be in the ranges of 700. And, you know, bad scores end up being in the ranges south of 600. So, again, you want to be intentional. You want to do things that could increase your credit. You want to pay back your debt on time. You want to not take too much, too much credit. And there is ways to monitor your credit. I have a, one of my credit cards sends me every month. Your score went up. Your score went down. Your score went up. Score went down. Why did it go up or down? Because as I'm charging money on my credit card during the month, I'm owing more money. And my score is kind of tending a little down. And when I pay that off, it goes back up again. So, again, if the, the key word of the day is intentional and thoughtfulness, be intentional and thoughtful and, and, and don't just sh shove this aside, but have it be part of your you know annual review of what you're doing and your life to just see where your credit score is. Okay, go ahead, Jen. Thank you, okay, so this slide is about how to start building your credit. And basically, as we talked about before, I know it's an interesting concept of the fact that you need credit to get credit. So um, I know you're thinking, right, how do you even start that? How do I get credit if I need it to get it? And um, the first start for a lot of people are called secure credit cards. There's traditional credit cards, which are the Visa, MasterCard, and Amex. So secure credit cards are where you basically um, give up some cash collateral or cash deposit to the credit card company. So in a sense, it is as if you are borrowing your own money, but that does allow the credit card company to give you an opportunity to show that you can pay it back. And I think that after you start showing your ability to pay and pay on time, that is when more creditors will say, okay, well, this person has shown their ability to repay and then someone else will um, give you a credit card or give you a loan. And that's similar uh, to... Um, the concept would be is if, you know, Jeff and I were co-workers and he loaned me money for lunch. And if I didn't pay Jeff back and Jeff tells Julie, another co-worker, and then I go to Julie and I say, hey, Julie, I need to borrow $10 for lunch. Well, Julie may not be so inclined to let me borrow the money. Why? Because Jeff told her that I didn't pay him back when I borrowed the money. So that is the most simple way to break down essentially how credit works. And there's no difference between Jeff and Julie or the credit card companies. And they communicate with each other through the credit report. So that's the purpose of the credit report. And that's why other uh, creditors will pull it to see what is your reputation with your other creditors. So, um, in, but it's also important to use credit cards and loans that actually report to credit bureaus. And prepaid gift cards and debit cards do not. So that's the difference between a credit card and a debit card. Now, the secure credit card can, re, can look a lot like a debit card. But the difference between the secure credit card where, as I said, you're going to put some money in 
the secure credit card reports to the credit agency. So that is the difference between a secure credit card and a debit card. They look a lot alike, but with the secure credit card, that's actually being reported. So that is going to give you some payment history. And then utility companies, car loans, store loans, which are like store credit cards, like an Apple or a Best Buy. Those are also uh, loans and uh, creditors that report to the credit agency. So just to, just to add a couple of things to what Jen just said. Um, so the, the concept of the secure credit card and why they report and why it helps you build your credit is you typically get, you know, you, you put a couple of hundred dollars down with them and then you start charging on the card. But at the end of the month, you will pay, you will get a statement and you will pay it back. Now, of course, the credit card company is protected. If you don't pay it back, they have you $200. But by paying back on a monthly basis, and that getting reported to the credit agencies, it is showing that you are responsible and you are paying back. That's why that helps you build credit where a debit card does not. And the important thing for those that are under 18 or those parents who have children who they're saying, how can I help them? You can do this before you're 18. So my daughter has what's called the step card. It's one of a different, many different types of secured credit cards. She got to design it. It's nice and pink. She put her signature on it. She has it on her phone. And basically, she basically charges it. And at the end of every month, I ask her to give me an analysis of what she spent. And then she does a budget for the next month. But again, being able to develop these good financial habits and be able to have information that when you turn 18 and going out and getting credit in your own name, that you can show three, six, nine, 12 months of a secured credit card, extremely important. And that is a critical way that people under 18 can start building credit. Go ahead, Jen. Okay. Top 10 tips for how to build good credit. These are listed out, as we talked about, use cards that report to the credit agencies, using a secure card, think before you spend, basically want versus need, check your balance frequently, paying your bills on time, um, pay as much as you can monthly, which is not only paying the minimum payment if you can. And, um, Running, you know, keeping up with your spending. Do not take out cash advances. Those typically have a higher interest rate than normally putting something on your card. So the interest rate, basically, you pay more for that money. So you don't want to necessarily do that if you can help it. Only apply for a few cards. We talked about that. You don't want to. And that relates back to your credit score. Because that will affect your credit score. That will bring your credit score down. If I go out and I get three new credit cards, I get credit card applications. I'm pre-approved. They tell me all the time that I don't accept those offers every time because that can negatively affect my credit score. Even if I don't put anything on it, sometimes just opening a new credit, uh, too many credit cards can affect it. I'll go to the next one, Jeff. So just a couple of things before we move on. So the thing before you spend is the one versus need. So if people could put in the chat, what are things in your life that are needs? That really, you don't really have a choice. They're, they're, they're things you, you need in living. What are some, some needs? Housing, exactly, right. Food, right. Groceries, rent, car insurance, you have your car, right. The, the, these are things that you need to have, right? You have a job you have, you have to drive to, you need, okay. Um, the wants are the vacations. The wants are going out to dinner. The wants are basically uh, buying new clothes. Being really to understand when you're going out to buy something, whether it's a want or a need is important. 
Uh, another, I also, you know, I like to use my uh, my my kids as uh, as examples and stories. So my son got his credit card when he was uh, when he was eighteen, was living at home, and he got his first bill, and it was an envelope in the mailbox. I go put it in his room, and I'm thinking, okay, um, he'll open it up. Three days later, I go in there, still not open. So I'm thinking, all right, do I want to be this helicopter parent? Do I want to be on top of him? Or is it something he needs to really learn? Uh, so I said, all right, he's going to learn. Four days later, still unopened. I, I go in and I just couldn't help myself. I said, Ryan, what's, what's going on? Why aren't you opening up? Don't you know you have to pay your bill? He says, no, I got it all under control. So what do you mean? He said, well, I um, when I signed up for the card, I put it on auto pay. So I know I get the bill on the 25th of the month. And it's due on the first, and I haven't taken out of my my account. I said, "Okay, that's good." Um, how do you know how much you spent? How do you know you have enough money in your bank account to pay? So he looks at me like a deer in the headlights. It's like, "How do you how do you know the charges on the card are correct?" He said, "What are you talking about? They wouldn't charge you if it's not correct." And then I told him the stories that on my credit cards I've seen fraud. So the point to him was, and I think he got it, is. Pay your not only pay your bills on time. Check your balance online frequently. Keep a running tab. Take the 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 the, the payments, the credit card slips, and make sure that you are being charged appropriately. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Jen. So this is just um basically how do you pay? This one just talks about which are the new popular uh methods of payments which is everybody has everything on their phone right you add your card to your apple wallet you don't have to know what you don't have to have the physical card um which are all good things convenient however you want to be more mindful because having access to the card that fast on your phone right you just walk up and you just tap that can lead to overspending because you are disassociated from actually what you're doing so you want to be mindful especially young people and also as we talked about um scams and things of that nature right we see all the time where someone can walk by you with a device and tap your phone and you want to make sure you have your tap secured you want to have that option to put your code in before it processes the payment so you want to be mindful of that. Um, I want to make sure they hear the next slide, though. Okay. The this one. Okay, just just one more thing on the on the Venmo and stuff. Understand how it works. It's easy to get scammed. My son was selling something off of Craigslist, and basically this person said, oh, "I want to send you, but I, you need to send me something to make sure the accounts are right." Yeah, it it didn't it didn't sound um, all that right. If something sounds wrong, it probably is wrong. Make sure you understand I on Venmo ask people to Venmo me for a request as opposed to me sending it, trying to find the right one. So I might want to send something to Jennifer Cruz, but I'm sure Jennifer Cruz is not the only Jennifer Cruz out there. And maybe she's Jennifer Cruz three. And if I sent to Jennifer Cruz two, good luck getting the money back. So really understand those payment apps. They're easy, they're convenient, but they're really, you can get in trouble. So now we're going to go through a slide or, or, you know, I think a funny video that talks about the difference between the debit card and a credit card. Your total comes to 2238. Oh, okay. And how will you be paying for that today? Um, well, isn't it obvious? Shh, she can make her own decision. Uh, who said that? Hello. Ah! I can handle this purchase. Easy peasy. That's what debit cards do. Do you remember how awesome my rewards program is, though? Swipe me. We got this. I think what these two meant to say is that you want to use me. Prepaid debit. I mean, look at my logo. Just like a credit card. Cool, right? Please, you're nothing like me. I'm the only one here who can help build credit. You have literally zero effect on a credit score. But I don't need a whole sp your total uh, comes to 2238. Isn't it obvious? Shh, she can make her own decision. Uh, who said that? Hello! Ah! I can handle this purchase. Easy peasy. That's what debit cards do. Do you remember how awesome my rewards program is, though? 
Swipe me. We got this. I think what these two meant to say is that you want to use me. Prepaid debit. I mean, look at my logo. Just like a credit card. Cool, right? Please, you're nothing like me. I'm the only one here who can help build credit. You have literally zero effect on a credit score. But I don't need a whole special approval process. I'm accessible. Anyone can own me. I'm pretty accessible, too. And I tend to have less fees than you do, prepaid debit. Oh, yeah? Name one. Activation fees. Sometimes. Transaction fees. Not always. Reload fees. Whoa. Maintenance fees. I said one. At least I don't have to worry about crazy interest rates or overdraft fees. I do charge interest on balances, but that's the trade-off for a generous credit limit. You're limited to the amount loaded onto you. And you're limited to how much is in your checking account. <laughs> right. That's why people who hang out with you too much get into tons of debt. And every day it sounds like there's a headline about a new credit card data breach. <sighs> Don't give me that attitude. Debit and I are protected by federal law to minimize liability caused by that kind of stuff. If you get lost or stolen, you're out of luck most of the time. You're just jealous because everyone thinks I'm cool and you can't handle it. How dare you challenge me, you good-for-nothing piece of plastic. Don't checking and savings accounts mean anything uh, to guys. anybody anymore? Guys, let's be cool. Can you just try and say something nice about each other? Come on. I know you can do it. Well, credit does have cool rewards. And if you're smart about it and don't carry a balance, she can be pretty great. And I guess prepaid debit can come in handy, like if you're traveling. You can use it in lots of different places. And if it gets lost or stolen, it can't be used to access your account. And debit, like, I totally admire your affordability. And you can be used to take out cash from ATMs all over the world. You kind of rock at managing money, I must say. See, was that so difficult? I guess not. But getting back to your purchase... How are you going to pay? Yeah, Jen. Who are you going to choose? Please, 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 please. Pick me, pick Who's me. Who's it going to be? Pick me, pick me, pick me. Oh, I'm just going to pay with cash this time. No. Really? No. No you way. Can't you can't kidding me. <laughs> I don't know who saw that coming, the ending, but uh, that was the... And I, I apologize for st stopping in the middle. I was trying. There was a little box in the middle of the screen. I was trying to get rid of it, but beyond my technological... Uh, uh, capacity. So, um, who is using a, a credit card uh, right now? By by putting in the uh, in the chat, just to get a sense. Also, I, I'd like you, if you're using a debit card, to basically take out your debit card and tell me what um, what you see on it. Whether you see any logos on your debit card. Okay. All right, Dimitri said MC, so I think that's MasterCard Visa. What, what, you know, I told you to take out your credit card, not your debit card. So it seems like everyone's debit card has Visa and MasterCard and American Express. Why? It's supposed to be a debit card. Does anyone know? And this is something I actually found out when I was actually starting to give these presentations. Does anyone know why there's a MasterCard or Visa logo on your debit card? Okay, so the answer is cl close, but if it says Visa, you can use your debit card any place that a Visa card is accepted. That's the importance of that logo. But it's also important when you basically take out of your wallet and you're there online, which one you use. Again, my daughter, she has a debit card and she has a credit card, our credit card, she's 17. And basically, she came to me once and said, my my uh, my debit card was declined. It said I had no more money. I said, well, you're probably using your debit card instead of your credit card. No, 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 no. I know when I use my credit card, I use my debit card. Let's go online and see. Okay, you only have 19 cents left in your debit card account. Really? Yeah, you basically paid, you know, you went into H&M and you spent $30 on a shirt. Oh, no, no, I use my credit card. No, you didn't. So the importance is, and it's easy to mix it up. So um, be sure you know what you're paying for to prevent you being in that situation. Okay, so let's see. So what are some good reasons to have credit cards? Let's go through these fairly quickly. Emergencies, you know, there are gonna be medical bills. There's gonna be a transmission on your car. There's gonna be a broken refrigerator. There are going to be things that come up. And I think I saw a statistic uh, uh, this week that said 70% of people in the United States do not have a thousand dollars for an emergency. And that's when you think of it, that's you know, 
emergencies happen, right? So having a credit card, again, you may not be able to pay it off in full, but if the choice is not having a refrigerator that works or not having a tire, you know, it's not a close call. So emergencies is important. Online purchases, yeah, I I I, I haven't seen any heard anyone who could use cash on an Amazon, right? You just can't. You have to have a credit or a debit or something. Establish a credit history. Yes, as we've talked about, you have you have credit, you use credit. When you have a credit card, start putting things on your credit card that you know you have the money for and pay it back so you can start using it. So the answer here is obviously all above. Now, what are some downsides to credit cards? Now, this is kind of a little tricky because most people say it's all of the above. And actually, that's not the right answer. And why isn't that the right answer? Well, it's number one says credit cards are expensive. They are not if used appropriately. OK. There are a lot of credit cards that have zero annual fee. There are a lot of credit cards that and all credit cards, if you pay off your bill in full, you don't pay a penny. OK, very important. And it goes to searching for the right credit card. When my son was starting, um, uh, when he was turning 18, I said, go investigate, go look. Go look at what the annual rates are, annual fees are. Go look at what, uh, what the, um, the interest rate is. Go look at what the grace period to pay it back is. Go look at what the rewards are. Go look at what, you know, if you're going to go and travel, what foreign transaction fees. Look at all the different things. And he came back and said, I had two choices. I had a card I could have and um, discover that if I got a B, B average, I'd get 2% back. Or I have the card that I could have the Kings logo on, the LA Kings hockey team. And he picked that. Now, I'm not sure I would have picked that. I kind of would have liked the 2% back if I was him. But the point is he went and he analyzed and he evaluated what the different credit card offers were. And that's what I would recommend. Anyone that goes in, two credit cards are not the same. Making sure you have one that doesn't have an annual fee is very important. Buying, want, buying uh, wants versus needs over spending, we talked about it. Using a credit card, downside, your mind plays tricks on you. Accumulating debt, the big one, right? Using the credit cards and not paying it back, you're going to accumulate that debt and then get to the point where you feel hopeless, which we don't want you to be. Okay. So what's in your wallet? I think we talked about people having a credit card, so we could skip over that. So, yeah. So, again, to go to, I guess this is me still... Um, a debit card is like cash. It's money taken out of your account, right? It's your money. It's not a credit transaction. That's the difference between a credit card. A credit card is you're borrowing someone else's money. They are lending you money. They're paying a fee for lending you that money. And that as a result, um, there's a credit transaction that is created. Okay, so I think this is you now, Jen. Yeah. How do, how credit cards work? We talked a lot about this. It, we are, I want to make sure that we have time for questions. So we talked about how credit cards work thoroughly, I believe. So you can go to, I want to make sure they see the slide about interest. The next one. Here we go. Interest, this is very, very important. This is a very, very important slide because interest is very, very important when it comes to borrowing money because interest determines how much money you have to pay for that money that you borrow, right? And credit cards typically tend to have, now your credit score can determine your interest as well. So this kind of goes into how your credit score goes into how you obtain credit because your credit score is going to determine sometimes what's the interest rate that the creditor is going to charge you to loan you the money, right? Because that all leads back to the things that we talked about that determines your credit score, which is the amount of money that you owe and also your payment history. So interest is what the bank charges you to borrow the money. The higher the interest rate, the more you pay, the longer it takes to pay the debt and the more interest you pay. And credit cards company charge compound interest that's interest on interest so that is why it's so important to pay as much as you can every month pay it at least a minimum payment every month you don't want to miss a payment that goes back to your payment history that can knock your score down which in turn will cause you to pay more going in the future so um 
you want to pay as much as you can on credit cards every month. You don't want to charge too much because the higher, the more you charge, the more interest rate that they charge every month. And then that leads to the debt cycle, which is very, very difficult for people to get out of. Um, and, and, and while this basically isn't a course on savings, the savings is the flip side. You put money away when you're young. You earn interest on that money. Now, since interest rates are higher than they had been for a very long time, you can actually earn some good interest rate, 4 or 5% on money. And you would be surprised that if you put a few hundred dollars away, you know, every few months, if you look at what that will be in 20 or 30 years, you'd be shocked at how much it grows. Just like the amount of money you owe will grow faster and quicker than you think, the money you save will also grow faster and quicker than you think. So what is a, min a minimum payment? That is the, min the minimum payment is set by the creditor. And typically the minimum payment, a majority of that payment is the interest. So a majority of that payment, when you get a credit, uh, a statement, which we're going to show you a copy of a statement um, soon, typically the the minimum payment, major 80% of it is going to cover that interest that they charged you. And the very minimal amount of that minimum payment is going to go to the principal. So that's why it's important to pay more than the minimum payment if you can, because paying the minimum payment doesn't necessarily get you out of debt, especially if you keep using that card. So I think the 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 next one is that okay. I, uh, that one. <laughs> this is the key. This is always, I think, the most impactful slide. And if you take away anything from this course, I think this is the slide. This is what's going to show you, building on what Jennifer said, what if you pay the minimum payment, which is typically one, two, or three percent of the amount that's owed. Okay. So let's let's say you know your high school student, your your senior year. You're basically going and you want to buy the new iPhone, right? Because it has a new camera and you want to take pictures at prom and you want to take pictures with your friends. You're not going to see them anymore every, or, you know, as much. Everyone's going off to different things. So you say, OK, I'm going to wait. I'm going to save up money during the spring, spring semester. And then right before prom, I will have the $1,500 to buy it. People will give me gifts. I'll save money, et cetera. You buy that on credit. You pay it off right away. No problem, right? Even though the interest rate is 30%, you made one payment. You didn't pay anything. Zero interest paid, zero the cost of the loan. Now let's say it's January. You said, look, I get it. I could wait six months, but I'd really like to have it. There's a lot of events. There's the last football games. There's, you know, I want to, I want to take pictures around. I don't want to wait, but I know I'm going to have the money in six months. I'm going to have it over six months. So you say, okay, that's what I'll do. I'll buy it now and I'll pay it off in six payments here. This shows that your interest paid is $134. So you're paying $1,634. So you say, maybe that was worth it, an extra $134 to have it for six months. But now let's see that you make the only the minimum payments, the third column, only the minimum payments, which is $60, okay? That's basically 4%. You will make 131 payments. 11 years it's going to take you to pay off that iPhone. Okay, and that's of course, if you don't use your credit card to buy anything else, you will end up paying $2,094 in interest and it'll cost you $3,600. You will be paying off the iPhone 13 when the iPhone 22 comes out, okay? And now let's say you have really bad credit, okay? You have no credit or you've made some missteps, and your interest rate is 36% almost. It'll take you 15 years. That's the important thing that people need to think about. When you basically buy something, are you going to be able to pay it off or not? Because if you don't, you could see how people could run up thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of debt. It's easy. And it doesn't mean someone's stupid. It doesn't mean someone is, that you know, people get down on themselves for having done that. This happens to hundreds of thousands and millions of young adults and people across the country. Let's make sure it doesn't happen to you. And here is just a sort of uh, puts the point in a little video. 
Love your dress. I got it on sale for 200 bucks, but it's more like 415 since I haven't paid off that credit card yet. That dinner was insane. <laughs> Not as insane as us spending another $173 on it this year. New laptop? Nice. Thanks. And with credit card interest, I'll spend an extra 1900 on it. No. See, people never think about that, but that's the practical reality. It, uh, sadly so. Right. Love your dress. Jeff, I love this uh, conversation and I, I think we are all uh, enjoying it. And I would like to say if you need an extra few minutes to finish, uh, I think we will we'll all be available. Okay. Yeah, we have like four or five more slides and then we'd like to have a few minutes for questions. But uh, yeah. Okay. So pay, pay, pay it off every month or at least as much as you can, right? You may not be able to pay everything off, but don't fall into the trap of the minimum payment. Okay, and this here is a, a credit card statement, okay? So on the left here are the transactions. Make sure that you did pay for the Amazon. That's the Amazon charge is yours. Make sure that the Paramount cable is yours, the Spotify. Make sure. That's another thing. Everyone signs up for these monthly charges. I mean, I, I just did, you know, last, last month, I went through and I said, okay, I want to see all the charges. It's, it was staggering. All the things that I had auto-deducted. There was like 15 or 18 different things. Be mindful of that. But here's the credit card statement, right? The date due, the balance, the minimum payment. You see, those are the big numbers, right? Those are the things they want you to look. Oh, minimum payment. Wow, all I have to pay is $247. I could do that. But if you look below, if you pay the minimum payment, it'll take you 25 years to pay it off. And that's if you put nothing else on it. If you put nothing else on it, it is staggering. It is so easy to fall into this trap so easy and then you'll get you know people say oh i can repair your credit i can go and i can negotiate these things down for you yeah you may be able to negotiate things down credit card companies have a lot of bad debt you don't want to do that because that will be on your credit report for seven years that will affect your ability to get credit that will have essentially ruined your ability to get good credit and you don't want that to happen okay so is this still me? I think this is still me. So fees, so many different fees. They get you all different ways. There's the annual fee. There's the late fee, okay? There is a fee over the limit fee. There's the cash advance fee. Don't ever use cash advance fee. That is just that is just really a waste of, waste of money. All these different fees, understand when you get a credit card, what all those fees are. But you know what the good thing is? If you do your research, you don't have to pay an annual fee. If you basically pay on time, you don't pay a late fee. If you make sure you don't go over your, your, your pre-approved limit, you don't have an over limit fee. And if you don't take any cash out, advance out, you don't have a cash advance fee. So by a show of hands, who thinks there are, the credit card companies make more on interest or more on fees? One, it, just put in the chat. It was staggering when I basically found out the answer to this. There's interest in some people say interest, some people say fees. The answer is fees. They make more on fees than interest. Just think about that. They make $180 billion annually on both interest and fees. And I think it's like 60% is on fees and 40% on interest. Staggering. It's because people don't understand it. Even I sometimes get intimidated. I'm a lawyer with 35 years of law degree. You see some of these documents that's supposed to be truth in, truth in lending disclosure. They are intimidating. Don't sign something you don't understand. Again, a simple, a simple uh, a piece of advice, but a lot of people don't do it. Okay, now let's look at poor Stanley. I'm Stanley Johnson. I've got a great family. I've got a four bedroom house and a great community. Like my car, it's new. I even belong to the local golf club. How do I do it? I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. I can barely pay my finance charges. Somebody help me. See, look, and the point there is there are a lot of people out there that you think have their life together, right? They have a nice car, they have a nice house. It's not only people at the lower levels of the economy that run into trouble. Because why? Because people tend, the more they make, 
they just spend it. And whether it's because they want to have a certain image and living in Los Angeles, it's kind of tough, right? It's a different world than living, say, elsewhere in the country. Don't fall into the trap. Don't fall in that you feel you have to be a certain way. You have to do certain things. You make more money, you can go out and spend it. It's a recipe for a disaster. Rather, figure out your needs and wants, figure out what you could save, put the money away so that when you get older and you come to the point where you're going to retire, you'll have some money. I'm Stanley Jones. There we go. All right. Do you want to uh, start taking the... Uh, the, yeah, the do we have out? any... Yeah. Um, we talked about this in um, great detail as we talked about, think about, think before you spend, minimum payments. When we talk about minimum payments, for those who do not have the ability to pay off the entire balance every time you charge something, right? I know that that's a concept because if, when I think about it, of course, if I had the ability to pay the entire balance for the thing, the, for whatever I purchased at that time, I wouldn't have put it on the credit card, right? So a lot of us out there are not in that position. And I think that the one thing that I want to uh, say to those that are not in that position, and it's something that I do, you just want to budget. You want to, if you have to put something on your card, I like to, if there's something I really want now and I want to put it on my card, then one, don't make the, you know, you don't want to just make minimum payments but you want to have an idea of the timeline in which you want to pay it off. If I put something on my car for a thousand dollars, I'll think about the interest and everything, but I'll say, you know what, I'm going to pay $150 uh, every month until I pay this off or whatever your budget can afford you to do. Hopefully it's over the minimum payment. We discussed the the tragedies of just paying the minimum payment. So that is a tip that I wanted to give you all, especially because a majority of us, as I said, we are not in a position to put something on a card, pay it right off. Um, but you want to have an idea in mind of when you want to have a goal on which you want to pay it off. You don't just want to put it on there and then it's just there. I like to set a goal and say, I'm going to put this on my card. Maybe I need a computer. I need something, especially if it's a big ticket item. Have an idea in your mind, a goal in which you want to pay that off. And, you know, do whatever you have to do every month, whether it's not go out to eat as much, whether it's packing your lunch as opposed to going to lunch with your coworkers for a temporary time. It doesn't have to be forever. But uh, those are just a few tips that I wanted to tell you all um, as far as charging things and paying things off, uh, because, of course, the majority of us are not in the position to charge it and pay it off completely. But um and we talked about these. I don't want to reiterate because we're pressed for time. But if anyone had any uh, questions for Jeff and I. So just before we go to the questions, just, uh, you know, this is here where we figure out what type of impact we had. So we're back to the one to 10 scale. If people can put in the chat where they think their knowledge of financial literacy is now. Okay. Well, look, it, it, it looks like people believe that this was helpful um, because I see a lot more sevens, eights, nines um, from where we were at the beginning. Um, again, this is a lifelong uh, process. We all learn things um, about, you know, budgeting, about credit and whatnot. Uh, we hope this has been helpful. We hope, again, the important point is that you're thoughtful in the decisions you make and that you're equipped if you're a young adult going out into the world and being financially independent. And if you're someone who's been out in the world and maybe has made some mistakes that you have a little bit more understanding about it and it'll help you in the future. Um, but we, let's see, I think we have a question. Let's see, what's this question? That's if I'm like, uh, then, but then, Yeah, I mean, I think the good it's a good point is as you basically get um, your your income increases, you have more money, you get higher limits. It's sometimes a little more difficult to manage. So with those higher limits become uh, really financial responsibility. I mean, part of the 
big financial crisis around 10, 15 years ago was money was so easily available. People took advantage of it. People got house loans thinking houses would basically continue to increase in price. People took out loans to, to buy furniture and whatnot. And then when housing sort of came crashing down, basically it was a problem. So again, it's being thoughtful and it's again, not only for people starting out, it's people for how to effectively manage their credit over a lifetime. Okay, what do you recommend when starting your credit? Well, the secured credit card, that's extremely important, right? Get a secured credit card show, because you, you, you won't have to have a, a, a big income. You won't have to have assets. But again, as we said, you'll be able to demonstrate that you will be paying back. So after doing that for a while, um, if you don't have that, then, you know, obviously getting in someone could co-sign for you. But when you get a job, there will be cre credit cards that are geared towards people who are um, not as, say, well off or at the beginning of the process, but a secured credit card. Step card, step card is the name. Yep. Look on it. Um, again, I, I got it from my, my daughter. You know, the interesting thing is there, we don't have to make monthly payments. It's a secured credit card, but they said they report to the credit agencies. So she's been using it for around a year now, and it's a very helpful, it's not the only one. So I mean, I'm not here to do an advertisement for STEP. It's just based upon my experience. That's what I use for my daughter. What is it? What is that? Let's see. What, what, what is that tip? Uh, is allowed on credit. What, 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 aren't we using credit to pay? Is it borrowed money? Why is it that a tip on, is allowed on credit? I'm not sure I understand it. What banks do you prefer to get credit card? Jen, if you want to answer any of these questions, but what banks do you prefer? Look, there, there. it doesn't really matter. I mean, look, there are a lot of banks that are out there that are well-known, you know, JP Morgan, Chase, Wells Fargo, US Bank, but it doesn't really matter. The point is research research right. you want to um right um we can't necessarily tell you any banks that you prefer um i personally uh you know don't have any personal recommendations because it's all depending on the fees the interest the uh the type of car and it all depends on what works best for you um there is a question about closing a credit card. Someone said, can you speak about closing a credit card and the effect it can have on your credit score? Actually, closing a credit card or closing an account will bring your score down. Um, so you don't want to close the credit card if you don't have to. Um, because it will, closing an account will bring you, your score down. I paid off a car recently. And you're thinking that would be a good thing, right? Shouldn't I get some type of gold star for paying off my car on time, all on time payments, really paid it off a little easily um, and a little early. However, my score did go down a little bit when that account closed. So closing a credit account, closing a credit card is not a... Uh, is not helpful. I, I think the flip side to that, Jen, is because if you have too many credit cards, you basically, your score will go down. So for example, my wife has a Nordstrom's card. We don't use it. We haven't used it in three years. We just went to went to close it down, which kind of, it's not that easy. It's easy to open an account. It's a lot harder to close it. But I think it depends upon the circumstances. I'm not sure categorically I would say that closing an account necessarily, because if you have available credit, it will go. So, you know, people... Some people get these credit cards at H&M or Best Buy, 10% off, you know, it's which is, you shouldn't do it. Again, you shouldn't just accumulate uh, credit cards. But I think it depends on the circumstance, but usually contacting the credit credit card company. Right. But 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 typically closing an account will not have it a positive. So no. where can adults in financial crisis get help? I mean, that's a good one. We don't have, I'm not sure we have one to recommend. I know when people are considering filing individual bankruptcies, they have to go through some credit counseling. So we could uh, we could try to get back to you on, on, on that one. Don't have one right uh, right um, right off the bat. Right, but there are nonprofits. Um, maybe like, I mean, there are, uh, as far as like, you know, legal aid and stuff like that, uh, if, you know, you're to the point to where you need uh legal advice um there are you know um a lot of 
legal aid um will have someone that you know works in in bankruptcy i know there's a public counsel they can um help folks that need to file for bankruptcy as well in the la area or it doesn't necessarily mean file for bankruptcy but you can speak with a lawyer because sometimes you it, it that may be the option or it may not but it's just one of those things where it depends on the per the person's uh financial situation and one last question and then we would like to put up the qr code to get evaluations which the question was how harshly is student loans considered look uh when you're applying for for other loans look student loan debt is debt Look, if you're paying off your student loan debt, it's it's uh, again, it goes to your credit score, it goes to your amount. One of the first things we talked about capacity. If you have ten thousand dollars of student loans um, and you're making thirty thousand dollars, it may be challenging to get a credit card with a high um, uh, limit. Maybe you'll get one with a thousand dollar limit. I think those are pretty much uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 entry level one. So any type of debt is going to uh, affect um, your capacity. But being and having a good credit score, if you pay off that debt, it's going to help you. Okay. So actually, yeah. So if you could just click on this QR code, you know, we've been doing this for a few years. We do mainly these in person. Um, virtually, obviously, is uh, we also do them. So it's a little different, uh, uh, different experience. But we really would appreciate any feedback, positive or negative. This, you know, again, our goal is to try to communicate this information in a interesting, entertaining, and and thoughtful way. And we always like to know if we uh, accomplished our goal. Okay, and that's uh, while people are filling out their forms. I know Capri or Denise, if you have any closing uh, comments or yes, a couple of uh, pre uh, announcements. Yes, I I really wanted to take some time to tell everyone thank you so much for being here with us, and to also let you know that we have other upper mobility programming um, work that's happening. Roxy and Angie have uh, worked hard to cook up another event that's that's coming up uh, called Medical Day. And I believe they can share information about the flyer. And this helps people that are uh, from underrepresented communities um, on their journey to become doctors or other, other, um, other assignments in the medical field. So um, if we could share information about that, I'd really appreciate it. And I don't know if Angie or Roxy, if you want to uh, put the um, information on the screen, but we definitely yes. want you all to follow us too. Also, that last thing I'll just say quickly, be sure to follow us at LA Civil Rights. And um, you can also go to LA is for everyone. It's on Angie's back a drop um, on the screen. Uh, it says LA is for everyone. So all you have to do is LA is for everyone.com. And that takes us to our website and you can sign up for our newsletter and get more information on products and services that we are offering. Um, we fight hate discrimination and, um, and we also fight inequities um, such as uh, making sure that people are able to have upward mobility um, in Los Angeles. So thank you so much for being here. I'm so grateful for you, Jeff and Jennifer. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, it was a pleasure. And I think we're sharing the screen. Angie or Roxy, are you sharing the screen too? We are about to share the screen right now. Um, Just so you can see the information about the other event. Thank you so much, everyone, at LA Civil Rights. And then, of course, our website. If we can put the website in the chat that folks can link to, that'd be great as well. Even Mina, you can do that for us, maybe. Here you go. So we have these two events, LA Medical Day and the FAFSA Student Loan webinars, these are coming out this coming month in February, LA Medical Day being on February 10th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And the FAFSA Student Loan being on February 24th, 1030 to 1230 p.m. Again, these are all virtual. These are going to be free as well, and they're all going to be recorded. So after this presentation, when the by next week, we will be sending out an email 
with this information so you can receive it. You're more than welcome to join both of them, but we really appreciate it. If you could also share this with your networks, if you know of anyone who's interested in getting into the healthcare professional field, we'd love to have them there. We have a lot of great speakers. Uh, we have the QR code over here, so you can definitely register right now if you'd like, or we'll just wait till we send you that email by next, well, this coming week. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, with that, keep the faith, keep the fight, and keep your money right. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> Bye now. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend, everyone.